Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And uh, welcome to this uh, homecoming philosophy colloquium at Westmont College. I'm Jim Taylor. I teach uh, philosophy here. And I'm also a Westmont alum, class of 78. And the reason we're having this event today, and I'm really pleased to see so many people here uh, to participate in the conversation, the reason this is happening is because a couple of alums were, had a conversation back in January or so. Tom Taylor, who's here from the class of 1981, a philosophy alum, uh, was talking with Annette Richards, class of 1998, and uh, it was because of their inspiration that uh, we had the idea for this. Uh, so thanks to both of you. I'm glad you could both be here. Um, and uh, the event is being sponsored not only by the philosophy department, but also by the provost's office and uh, by the Getty Institute for the Liberal Arts. And so we thank those groups for their generosity in supporting this. We have uh, two speakers who will be uh, speaking to us today about books that they've recently written. Uh, and uh, I will show you the books as I, as I introduce our speakers. Uh, the first speaker will be Greg Tin Elsoff, who uh, teaches at Biola. Uh, so let me tell you a little bit about him. Greg got his PhD at the University of Southern California, an MA at Talbot School of Theology. And uh, in his 11 years at Biola U University, uh, he tells me that he has lost only three games of darts to a student during office hours. So <laughs> claim to fame. His, interests, his areas of interest include metaphysics, epistemology, modern philosophy, and Confucianism. He has published articles in the Modern Schoolman, Grotzer Philos Philosophische Studien, the Journal of Philosophical Research, International Studies in Philosophy, Philosophia Christi, and Christian Scholars Review. His most recent book is entitled, I Told Me So, Self-Deception and the Christian Life, published by Eerdmans in 2009, and was recently named Christianity, Christianity Today's 2009, I thought it was 2010. At any rate, recently uh, named by them uh, as Book of the Year in the, Christian, in the category of Christian living. Uh, Greg lives with his wife, Laurel, and three children in Brea, California. Uh, by the way, this book and uh, the other book that I'm going to show you in a minute is available for purchase in the student store on the other side of the building here. Uh, the other speaker uh, who will come up uh, as soon as Greg is, is done talking to us about his book is uh, Patrick Downey. Although Patrick graduated with a BA in philosophy from Pitzer College in 1980, he took a leave of absence his sophomore year and attended Westmont in the fall of 1977 through the spring of 1978 before returning to Claremont. Nevertheless, Patrick maintained dual loyalties during the next two years by loading, loading his lazy boy into his trunk every weekend and staying with Tom Taylor um, in his Van Campen and Arlington dorm rooms. In 1984, Patrick completed his Master of Theological Studies from Harvard Divinity School, and in 1994, com completed his PhD in Systematic Theology uh, at Boston College. The title of his first book, Serious Comedy, The Philosophical and Theological Significance of Tragic and Comic Writing in the Western Tradition, published by Lexington Books in 2001, bespeaks his interdisciplinary work at the edges of both philosophy and theology, and the three quarrels that make up our Western inheritance, that between the poets and the philosophers, Athens and Jerusalem, and the ancients and, ancients and moderns, those three uh, quarrels. His latest book, the one he'll be speaking to us about today, entitled Desperately Wicked, Philosophy, Christianity, and the Human Heart, was published by InterVarsity Press in 2009. And uh, he says it continues his ambition described in his high school yearbook uh, by uh, a, what was then, he says, a long-haired, puka-shelled Jesus freak to, quote, intelligently defend the gospel of Jesus Christ. Patrick Downey is now a professor and chairman of the philosophy department at St. Mary's, Mary's College of California and lives with his wife, Lisa, and four daughters in San Ramon, California. So uh, please welcome these two speakers, and uh, we'll have them up to speak to us. So I will uh, uh, let Greg have the podium at this point to speak to us for about a half hour about his book, and then when he's done, uh, we'll invite Patrick to come up and uh, speak to us about the same length of time about his book, and after that, we'll have a conversation. Greg. 
Uh, thanks, Jim, and um, um, thanks to everybody involved in getting this together. Um, it's a real joy uh, for me to be here and a real honor for me to be here. I have um, just wonderful memories of this place, uh, not least of which I met my wife uh, here, freshman year in Page Hall, and uh, uh, my life has been immeasurably better ever since. I have a, uh, vivid memories of this building, uh, though sadly not this room. Um, um, this is where all the highfalutin academic stuff happened uh, when I was a student here. But just upstairs and a little to the right is, or at least was, uh, the office of the Dean of Students. And uh, I was there really quite often. <laughs> and um, so uh, have memories of this building, though not quite as fond as uh, my memories of uh, Page Hall. Um, but I should say my, my senior year, spring semester of my senior year, I, uh, I sort of discovered uh, the joy of learning uh, a little bit late in my college career, but better late than never, in a uh, class taught by uh, Professor Wenberg, um, who introduced me to um, just how wonderful learning can be and the wonderful frustration that is the study of philosophy. And uh, so just as I was leaving here, I got set on the vocational course uh, that I'm on today. So I'm just extremely grateful for this, uh, for this place and the chance to be here. So my topic is uh, self-deception. Um, Sadly, perhaps an all too familiar topic uh, for many of us. Uh, scripture, as it turns out, is peppered with um, uh, talk of the poisonous effects of self-deception. Uh, the prophet Jeremiah expressed a kind of amazement at the capacity of the desperately sick heart to deceive itself. We'll hear more about that, I'm sure, from Patrick. The prophet uh, Obadiah explains that it's our pride uh, that often leads us into self-deception. The Apostle Paul explains in his letter to the Galatians how self-deception enables folks who are really nothing to convince themselves that they're, they're something. Um, and in his uh, rather depressing description of the flight from God in the first chapter of Romans, Paul mentions the amazing capacity that we have to suppress truths that are plain and obvious uh, to us and goes on to describe the disaster um, that happens when we do. And then finally, John explains how self-deception helps us to flee from repentance, uh, from the sins that plague us when repentance is really uh, uh, what is called for. So we've got good reason to think that self-deception is uh, alive and well in our midst, but uh, interesting questions. Um, what is it exactly? What is self-deception? Uh, what does it look like? How does it work? Uh, where does it tend to show up in our experience? And as Christians, where does it tend, up, uh, tend to show up in our experience? And then what can we do about it insofar as we're aware of self-deception? Uh, what can we do? So these are the, these are the questions uh, around which I'm hoping to generate uh, some conversation. And I should say, for me, really, the conversation is the real thing. I'm glad we're doing that, uh, Jim. I'm, I like conversation better than speeches. And so, uh, in fact, this is a far bigger group than I'm uh, at all comfortable with. So I'm going to pretend you're all about 10 people, and, and we're just sort of sitting around a table. And I'll try to get just enough out on the table um, so that we can have a conversation. So first, uh, what is it? Uh, what is self-deception? Um, maybe a few uh, recognizable uh, cases. There's the, uh, the father whose uh, son is smoking pot, and, and you know, everybody knows it. The evidence is obvious, except, of course, the father, right, who, who seems unable to see the evidence, which is so obvious to everybody. Or the same thing for the, the husband whose wife is cheating, and everybody can see it. It's, it's obvious to everyone, except, of course, uh, the poor uh, husband, or um, uh, perhaps um, somebody who uh, would swear that she believes that uh, people of all ethnicities are equally worthy of, of love and respect. Right? She would swear that she believes this, but uh, you spend half a day with her and it's just clear that she doesn't believe any such thing. She's convinced herself that she believes something uh, that she doesn't. Closer to home, uh, for me anyway, um, I'm a college professor, have been for about uh, 10 years, and I work reasonably hard at uh, what I do, and um, uh, in my honest and sort of solitary moments when there's no reason to be, you know, to, to be falsely humble, uh, I'd say I'm a better than average teacher. I, I, I think I do it uh, better than the average teacher anyway. Turns out I'm in good company, a recent and depressing study uh, revealed that 94% of the people who do what I do think they're doing a better than average job. 94%. <laughs> 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 
So uh, clearly, uh, quite a few of us are sadly and obviously mistaken. Perhaps more seriously, I, I work, uh, I wasn't going to mention it, but since you did, I guess now it's free. I work at Biola. <laughs> and uh, so it's Christian University, and it's got a fairly detailed uh, statement of faith that faculty have to sign as a condition of their employment uh, each year. Every year with my contract, I'm presented with this uh, statement of faith, and I'm asked, in effect, do you still believe all of this stuff? I've got a, uh, a home in Southern California, a mortgage. Um, my wife, Laurel, uh, put her career on pause when we had kids seven or eight years ago, so she's a full-time mom. Uh, I'm, uh, mine is the only source of income that we have. Jobs in philosophy are extremely difficult to get, very, very difficult to get a job teaching philosophy. So each year I'm presented with this contract and this statement and the question, do you still believe all this stuff? Uh, guess what the answer is? Of course, <laughs> right? Of course I still believe all of this stuff. Imagine the stomach it would take to admit to myself that I didn't believe it if, in fact, uh, I didn't. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having statements of faith. I'm for this. I'm glad there are institutions that define themselves around statements of faith. And I really do believe all that stuff. I do. <laughs> believe it all. <laughs> but we should go into this kind of arrangement eyes open to the kind of uh, pressure uh, generated um, uh, by the situation. So as it turns out, a fair bit of, of our felt well-being, the way we feel about ourselves at any given time, uh, depends on what we believe. Uh, what you believe determines in many ways how good you feel. So, so um, how you feel about your kids, how you feel about your, your spouse, how you feel about your faith. Um, I believe that I'm in a vibrant and growing uh, marriage um, with someone who's been faithful to me and continues to be faithful to me, uh, that I have some friendships that are deeper and richer than your average uh, friendships, that I'm relatively free of, of, the, of the really nasty kind of uh, racial bias, that I've successfully come over from being a non-Christian to being a Christian. Right? These are things I believe about myself, that, I'm, that God's not presently calling me to missionary work in Africa. And that if he did call me, if it was very, very clear, right, I'd go. Right, or at least I'd, I'd consider it seriously. Right. So each of these beliefs offers me a, a certain kind of uh, satisfaction. If I discovered that I was wrong about any of these things, right, it'd be pretty upsetting. I mean, what would it say about me if I wasn't ready to go to Africa if God called me to go? Or if I wasn't able to honestly sign the doctrinal statement that I have to sign in order to work uh, where I work? So it's in situations like these that life offers us the possibility of self-deception. Notice, none of these beliefs that I have have to be true in order to give me the satisfaction that they do, in fact, give me. Right? All, it's just that I have to believe them, whether or not they're true. So long as I believe them, they'll give me the, uh, the satisfaction that I feel. So one of the incredible things about the human condition is that we're able to manage our beliefs right? uh, so that we can experience these satisfactions even if the beliefs are false. Indeed, even if they're more or less obviously false, if what Paul says in Romans is true. So self-deception, this is what it is then. Self-deception happens whenever we manage our beliefs. We try to believe this or try not to believe that, not, in this, not for the sake of the pursuit of truth, but for some other reason. Right? We manage our beliefs for some reason other than the pursuit of truth. So when I talk about self-deception, that's what I'm talking about, the management of belief for some reason other than the pursuit of uh, truth. But you might wonder, um, how do we do it? I mean, how, how do you lie to yourself? How do, how do you get yourself uh, believing something that's false? There's a kind of paradox right here, right? Because if, if, uh, if I want to deceive David, right, it's not so hard. I just, I, I know something. No, for reasons having nothing to do with his gullibility or anything. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, b I believe something, I know it's true, but I tell him the opposite, and because he doesn't know that I'm telling a lie, he believes the opposite of the truth, and, and the job's done. But if you're going to lie to yourself, you're going to be both the deceiver and the deceived, and you might wonder, how am I going to manage that without catching myself in the act? Right? How am I going to lie to myself without catching myself in doing it? So there's this puzzle about self-deception. But really, I mean, in, at one level, it's not as hard as you might think. Um, so uh, I'm not a morning person. Um, and over the years, I've tried all kinds of different strategies to get myself out of bed and doing the things I need to do in the morning, um, one of the most effective of which has been self-deception. 
Uh, I lie to myself, so here's how you do it. Maybe you've done this. The night before, you take your alarm clock and you set it ahead like 13 minutes or 17 minutes fast. It has to be a weird number. It can't be like five or 10 minutes because you have to make the math hard in the morning. Right, so you set it ahead like 13 minutes or 23 minutes fast or something like that. And then, you know, and then you fall asleep. You wake up to the sound of the alarm. You look at the clock. You form the belief that it's, in fact, the time that the, that the alarm says it is. Right? You panic. You get out of bed. And you're on your way. Now, of course, two minutes later, you remember what you've done. Right? And so the, the lie only works for a small period of time. But you know, by that time, you're up and going. And it's done what it's needed to do. So at one level, it's not all that mysterious. But I mean, what if you wanted to, to lie to yourself over the long haul? You wanted to, and about significant uh, matters. And you wanted to keep yourself from catching yourself right, over a long period of time. Probably you're going to need some more subtle strategies, more nuanced strategies, something a little less uh, direct. And so um, here are some more uh, nuanced strategies for successfully uh, uh, deceiving yourself over the long haul. Right. Uh, just a few, um, and then we'll say something about what we might do about self-deception. Um, perhaps most prominently, there is a strategy called attention management. If you want to deceive yourself over the long haul, uh, attention management will be a good uh, tool for you. Uh, William James says somewhere that my experience is what I agree to attend to. I'll say that again. My experience is what I agree to attend to. You can manage your beliefs indirectly by making choices about where you direct your attention. Because where you direct your attention will affect the beliefs that you take on. So I have a, uh, I have a friend who a number of years back in his mid-30s, in the middle of a successful career and with a young family, decided that he had never, he'd been born and raised like me in a Christian home. And he'd never uh, really seriously considered whether or not the Christian beliefs with which he'd been raised were true or reasonable. And so he thought, it's about time I take a step back from all of this uh, and have a look, have an objective look at the evidence to see whether or not what I've believed all of this time has been true, reasonable. And I, as a Christian philosopher, applauded uh, the project. I thought this is wonderful, and I'd love to uh, be a conversation partner uh, with you in this. He said he's already, he'd already been uh, uh, a little ways down the road, and I asked him what he'd been reading. He took me over to his bookshelf, and there were eight, ten, I don't know, twelve books uh, on the top of his shelf. Not bad for a, a professional with a young uh, family working on this hobby. And um, so I thought, this is great, and I started to look at the books, and I noticed as I looked at them, they all had Christian authors. These were all books about the evidence for and against Christian belief written by Christian authors. And so I asked him, I said, or I pointed out, I said, these are all Christian authors. And he, he said, well, yeah, I've, I've sort of taken up apologetics as a, as a hobby. And I said, well, do you suppose there are any non-Christian authors writing on your topic? He thought about it for a moment. He said, well, yeah, I suppose there probably aren't. I said, do you know who any of them are? He said, well, no, I haven't really looked into that uh, sort of thing. Right? Attention management. So I don't, now, and I don't mean to suggest that what my friend was doing is a bad idea. There's nothing wrong with trying to shore up your faith uh, with evidence. And there's a wealth of very good material out there on the rationality of Christian belief. And Christians do well to get acquainted with it. This is all a good thing. But to think of this as a genuine checking in to the truth of Christian belief, sort of taking a step back and having an objective look, that's a bit of a stretch, right? I mean, it's a bit, it's a bit like checking into the claims of holistic medicine by reading the studies of only the practitioners of holistic medicine and, and sort of uh, assiduously <coughs> avoiding all of the stuff in the mainstream medical journals right, that might be critical of uh, holistic medicine. So the belief that Christianity is well supported by the evidence is for me a source of great comfort. I take great comfort in the idea that there's evidence that supports my faith. And it's also a source of great comfort for me to believe that I've taken a careful and objective look at the evidence for and against Christian claims, right? I, I, I like that picture of myself better, right? Instead of the picture of myself according to which I just blindly followed into the faith of my parents, uh, something like that. But an honest to goodness look at the evidence for and against Christian belief is hard. Right? It's hard. The material out there is really tricky, not to mention scary and risky. Right? This is scary and risky work. If it turned out that Christianity were irrational, I'd be faced with a pretty tough choice, right? Either I could settle into a faith that was irrational and just decide I'm game for that, right? I'm game for settling into an irrational faith, or 
I'd have to abandon my Christian faith and suffer, in my case, considerable social, financial, and all other kinds of uh, consequences. So life offers me a deal. Life offers us a deal. Uh, life gives me the opportunity to attend to the evidence for and against Christian belief, but attend to it in a way that more or less guarantees a certain outcome, namely that Christian faith is going to come out uh, reasonable. In this instance, attend to the evidence both for and against Christianity as presented by Christian thinkers. So through the careful direction of my attention, I can indirectly uh, manage my beliefs over the long haul. Attention management, first uh, really important strategy for uh, self-deception over the long haul. A second one, second strategy, very different kind of strategy, is called uh, resentiment. Resentiment. Resentiment involves a kind of reordering or renaming of our sentiments or our affections. Our, our sentiments or our emotions, um, they sometimes strike us, right, as unacceptable or inappropriate or inconvenient or otherwise undesirable. And think, think, for example, of the feelings you might have of anger or envy or spite or vindictiveness, right? ugly feelings. I don't like the thought of myself as having any of these feelings, but, I mean, indeed, I do have them sometimes, uh, these feelings. Sometimes, though, by renaming these sentiments, by giving them a different name, I can make myself a little bit easier uh, to live with. So, don't know if this is the place to talk about this, but I'm a little angry with Jim, have been for a little while, um, uh, feeling a little vindictive towards him, and uh, we were at a conference a year and a half ago or so, and he snubbed me for the purpose of talking to more important philosophers at the meeting, and I've been a little angry uh, ever since. I'm, this, I'm kidding. None of this happened. But I'd like nothing more, right? I'd like nothing more in the light of this to, to find some of our common friends and, and say all kinds of nasty things about Jim because of my vindictive uh, uh, spirit uh, uh, toward him. But I would never do that, right? I would never, out of anger, just gather around a bunch of our common friends and talk bad about Jim. I mean, that, that's just slander, right? And I, uh, if, if, you know, I'm not a slanderer. So how about this instead? I'm not, gonna, I'm not angry with him. I'm not going to do that out of anger. I'm concerned about Jim. <laughs> I'm, I'm concerned. Right? Aren't you? Aren't you concerned? Right? And, and uh, better, I'm sad. I'm sad for Jim because of the, the sorry state of his soul. It's just a sad, <laughs> uh, sad condition uh, that he's found himself into. And so what I'll do is I'll come to the prayer meeting and I'll spend 45 minutes um, explaining in painful detail all of his bad behavior and, and all of his false beliefs and everything he's doing wrong uh, because I'm concerned for him and we need to pray uh, uh, for Jim. Right? So someone might ask, well, you know, how, how'd that affect you? How'd, how'd you feel when he snubbed you at the, at the conference? And I say, well, I was angry, of course, who wouldn't be? Right? But I've forgiven Jim. Right? I've forgiven Jim, and now I'm just sad for him. Right? I'm, just, I'm just concerned uh, for him. So someone might finally suggest that we actually pray for Jim. This is a prayer meeting after all, so we'll spend five minutes or so presenting a summary version of Jim's failings to God as evidence uh, of his need for rescue or something. <laughs> so resentiment. You, re you rename your sentiments in order to make yourself a little easier uh, to live with. My friend Brian has a brand new flat screen TV that a common friend of ours gave to him and not to me. <laughs> uh, and I'm not uh, jealous about that. I'm not jealous at all. I, w I was at first just a, a bit, but, uh, but not anymore. I'm over that. Now I'm mostly just worried about Brian, <laughs> worried about Brian. and his family. Think of his family. I mean, with that new TV in the house, they're going to do nothing but watch TV. They're going to become couch potatoes for sure. And I wish for his sake that he'd never been given nasty things. <laughs> so you get the idea. So attention management and uh, resentiment, two important strategies. One more um, very important strategy called groupthink. Groupthink. <coughs> we need to say something about groupthink. There are, as it turns out, heights of self-deception that are only possible with the help of other people. You can never manage it on your own. The, sometimes things are so glaringly obvious that the only way to avoid them is with the help of other people who are equally committed to ignoring them. Right? You can never do it uh, on your own. Nietzsche put it nicely. He said, madness is rare in individuals, but in groups it's the rule. So there's a kind of, um, there's a kind of madness that can set in when groups uh, collaborate in their self-deceptive efforts. So Orange County, where I live, 
is one of the very richest regions in the history of human existence. Not just one of the richest places in the world, though it is that. It's one of the richest places in the history of the world. I spend most of my days with people that have wealth beyond the wildest imagination of, of the vast majority of people who've ever walked the planet. I spend most of my days with people uh, like that. But these same people, and let me say uh, as clearly as I can, I'm among them. <laughs> these same people, uh, they struggle with discontent over the material possessions that they still don't have. Isn't that remarkable? For me, it's a, a phone. Um, I ha it turns out they have phones. This is my phone. They have phones where each and every letter of the alphabet has its very own button. Right? And, but not my phone. My phone, if you want an L, you've got to hit the five three times you know, and, then, and then keep going. And I would just love to have one of these phones where each and every letter of the alphabet has its very own button. And, I, and I've, I've, the last few weeks I've shopped on Amazon. I'm looking back. I'm not going to get one, I don't think. But I, I'm just obsessed with these phones that have a button for each and every letter of the alphabet. And my life would be just so much better if I had one of those. Well, the Bible is clear, it seems to me, that this kind of materialism, the kind I've been describing, is a crippling barrier to the way of Jesus. Jesus taught, at the very least, that it's extremely difficult to have treasure without growing attached to it in your heart in a way that precludes full participation in his way. That's at the very least. Right? He, at the very least, he thought, if you've got treasure, it's going to be very hard not to get attached to it in a way that keeps you out of the way that I'm offering. Some people think he taught something much stronger, that you simply can't be a Christian and have wealth or, or be in his way and have wealth. But at the very least, he taught it was extremely difficult. So you might think it reasonable to suspect that materialism would be among the chief barriers to Christ following in Orange County. This is, after all, one of the richest places in the history of human existence. Wouldn't you think that maybe right, materialism is one of the chief barriers to Christ following? But I rarely hear explicit exhortation in the churches I attend that deals head on with materialism. We hear about other sins, I hear about other sins, uh, but we rarely are called to the carpet for our materialism, it seems to me. If you want to ruffle feathers in an Orange County church, just raise the question, just raise the question whether or not buying a new BMW can be justified in our world economy. You don't even have to present an answer. You don't have to say what you think about that. Just raising the question violates a little game we're playing with one another, right? according to which we won't bring things like that up in a very uh, direct way. And yet, if you plop me down in just about any other social context in the history of the world, the opportunity costs measured in terms of shareable basic necessities associated with buying a new BMW would raise questions so obvious as to be impossible to ignore. Right? Impossible to ignore. Or think, uh, perhaps a more silly example, uh, think about the amount of money that is spent in the United States every year on not smelling bad not smelling bad, right? and uh, you know, average household expenditure on not smelling bad as compared to average household uh, expenditure on alleviating world hunger or preventable disease or something like that. It's a little depressing once you raise <laughs> the question. So, so how can we ignore the opportunity costs? They're so obvious. How can we ignore the opportunity costs? Um, uh, it's only in a world, presumably, of other BMW owners and other people very much committed to not smelling bad, right, that we can ignore these obvious <coughs> questions. This is why the lifestyle and the next stratum up from wherever you are, right, it'll look to you like they're teetering on the edge of exorbitance and gross materialism. Right? Just the next stratum up, they're teetering on the edge. But it won't look so to those situated there. Right? To them, it'll look like that for the next uh, stratum. Uh, we, we surround ourselves with folks willing to ignore these questions uh, with respect to our particular standard of living. And in so doing, we make possible a kind of blindness not otherwise possible to the grip of materialism. Somebody said once, the last thing a rich man wants to do is to accuse his rich neighbor of being too rich. Uh, you don't want to do that. So attention management, uh, resentment, and groupthink, uh, really important strategies for uh, the project of self-deception. Let me spend just a couple of minutes saying um, something about what we might be able to do. Uh, it's a bleak picture <laughs> so far. I mean, you, you knew it was going to be a bleak picture today, right, just from the, from the ads. Uh, is there anything we can do? Well, I, I think there are some things we can do, and let me just say one. Let me 
uh, make a few comments about the kind of community building, a certain kind of community building that I think can forestall some of the negative effects, negative effects of self-deception. We know from having looked at groupthink that simply surrounding yourself with other people who are willing to be honest with you as best they can, uh, that's not guaranteed to help since they might be caught up in the same kind of self-deception uh, that you are. Um, they might make things worse. But I think we can make some progress by seeking membership in communities united by nothing more, nothing less to be sure, but nothing more than discipleship to Jesus. Nothing more than discipleship to Jesus. Groups, that is, that are not unified by socioeconomic standing. They're not unified by a certain political perspective. They're not unified by fine-grained theological distinctives or by loyalty to a particular Christian teacher or their movement. This isn't to say that we should set aside our differences, right, in order to come into community with one another. That, it seems to me, is ecumenicism gone bad. We shouldn't set aside our differences. Rather, when communities are formed under the banner of discipleship to Jesus and these other differences, socio-political, um, uh, theological differences, are preserved, right, then there's real hope of meaningful dialogue and progress together toward the truth. So try to come together with a diverse group of people retaining your differences. But these communities arguably will be just impossible if their members draw their primary identity from these socio-political or theological associations. If who you are at the very center is a Calvinist, right, or who you are at the very center is a Republican or something like that, that's, that's a primary part of your self-identity, uh, then the risk of discovering error will be extremely high. You can't come together with intelligent people who are going to question those things because if it turns out they're right, your whole self uh, is in trouble. So these communities have to be places where the grace and love and forgiveness of Christ flows so freely between members that finding out you're wrong is a cause for celebration right? and, and not for uh, defense. Right? Finding out you're wrong is a cause for, you know, you all are wrong about a whole bunch of stuff. You know that, right? This isn't a surprise. I'm wrong about a whole bunch of stuff. Y'all are wrong about a whole bunch of stuff. Have been for a long time, right? And, and to find out that you're wrong about something is a cause for celebration. Now I get to not be wrong about that thing anymore, right? I get, to, I get to go on not being wrong anymore, right? So finding out that you're wrong should be a cause for celebration and not defense. Um, but it won't be occasion for, for celebration. It'll be occasion for digging in of heels uh, if, if your belonging to the community is at risk, right? If finding out that you're wrong means you're going to be excluded uh, from your community. So groups without groupthink invite, pursue, and celebrate diversity and disagreement, not because of some vague commitment to political correctness, uh, uh, but because of a heartfelt desire to make progress toward the truth. The occasion, the occasion to have a safe and thoughtful conversation with somebody who loves you, somebody you'd leave your kids with, right, but who disagrees with you passionately, right, is, is, is a gift. It's a rare gift, and we ought to embrace it as such. Um, we tend to think that disagreement is a problem. Right? We've got we to somehow solve this problem of disagreement. But in the right context, uh, it's not a problem. It's an opportunity uh, to make progress together uh, toward the truth. So I think I'll stop there and, and uh, see where the conversation takes us. So thank you. Well, before I invite Patrick uh, up to uh, speak about his book, I'd just like to say, you know, I'm really feeling sad for Greg that, uh, you know, he felt so bad after that snub. But, you know, some people are overly sensitive. But actually, what I did want to say about Greg is that something I neglected to say before, uh, which you probably gathered uh, from hearing him talk about being at Westmont. He is a Westmont alum and uh, graduated in the class of 1992. And so welcome again. Thank you for your presentation. And now Patrick, uh, class of 80, would have graduated with the class of 80 if he had stayed here, but uh, we'll consider him to be an honorary alum. Please uh, come up and talk about your book. Uh, thank you for having me here. It's nice to be here again. Um, uh, I'm not sure why I left after being here one year, except I planned just to be here a year. So uh, <laughs> I was very divided about it, as evident by my geographical migrations. <laughs> but um, uh, I haven't been in this small or crowded a, or hot a room since I was in Pergos, Greece, <laughs> at a philosophy conference with Tom Taylor, actually. And we were up on the second floor in the mayor's office. 
and uh, it was fine except all the lectures and all the speaking and all the congratulatory toasts were in Greek, literally. Uh, <laughs> it was a long evening, so hopefully this will be in English so you can follow and it won't be so painful. Uh, my uh, book is uh, basically asking the question by the title. It, the, the quote is from uh, Jeremiah, the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things. Who can know it? And uh, knowledge, I think, will be the key that I want to get to. But the, the first question is, why is the heart desperately wicked and deceitful? I think the two go together. And um, my short answer is, it, the heart is desperately wicked because our bodies are unshareable. Okay, what do I mean by our bodies being unshareable? Well, the first clue, uh, the first image of what it would be to have a shareable body would be Adam and Eve and the image for a, a marriage, the, the two or one flesh. So insofar as they are two or one flesh, this seems to be the first concrete idea of what it would be for bodies to be shareable. Later we'll see more things tied into this. Uh, how do they no longer become shareable? Uh, well, the way, let me back up. The two are on flesh, but one other detail that's important for this, they were naked and unashamed. So both those aspects, the body, two bodies that are shareable and they're naked and unashamed, seems to be key here. And both of those will come up in, in the loss of shareability. Uh, insofar as we need to see uh, what happens that made us our bodies unshareable. This may seem the most obvious fact that our bodies are unshareable, but the biblical account, and we'll see the philosophical account, seems to say there's something not quite right with this. The anticipation that our bodies can be shared seems to be a fundamental anticipation, hope, memory, nostalgia, or whatever. Um, but I, but I'm, my book is trying to account for our hearts being desperately wicked in terms of this problem of unshareability. Okay, so I'm going to divide this problem two ways. One is into private bodies, and the other one, we'll see, is body politic. Uh, so to start with uh, private bodies, again, return to Adam and Eve. They eat, it, basically when Adam eats of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, his eyes are opened, their eyes are opened, and they cover themselves. So what did they see that made them cover themselves? That's kind of the question. Because the idea of covering themselves seems to imply if the two are one flesh, whatever they saw made it now that they had to put a barrier between these two bodies. It seems to be the inception of unshareability. Uh, what did they see? Well, a first clue as to what they see is they cover themselves with aprons made of uh, some sort of vegetable matter. But then as the narrative proceeds, they, God covers them with animal skins. So why did he have to cover them with something different than they initially covered themselves with? I think that gives us a clue as to what they saw that made them want to cover themselves. And uh, to, to, to say it briefly, what they saw is they had hearts that wanted to murder one another, just say as starkly as possible. They saw that their intentions, rather than their deeds, were murderous towards the other one's body. Murder being where you would eliminate that body that's not yours, you would get rid of it. And vice versa, each body wanted to, so to speak, eliminate, or you could just say swallow up the other to make it part of its body. So you could one set one sense say they're separated, two bodies. Uh, how would you share if you thought you should be sharing your body once that you would take that body into you and consume it, or you would eliminate it? Now, this sounds terribly harsh, especially between the first married couple. Uh, maybe not. Uh, but the... This, this claim, I think, is uh, brought out even more if you continue the story, and this has to do with a, a larger problem that flows from this, and this isn't just the problem of shareable private bodies. Also, and, and by the way, what did they see? You could say they saw their privates. We, we call that. Why do we call them privates? Because there's something about it. For the first time, their bodies, were, their bodies were private, and a private body means a private body can't be shared with somebody else's body. It wasn't a public body. It wasn't a body that you could share. Well, now, this becomes the political problem, because the political problem seems to be how can you come together and make a body politic? Because bodies don't seem to share, and yet you want a body politic. Uh, and this is why their, their children right away, Cain and Abel, kind of repeat in a different level this pattern of Adam and Eve, because Cain uh, offers a sacrifice, and it's uh, vegetation, no bloodshed. Abel offers the sacrifice for the fat portions, which implies that an animal was killed in order to make a sacrifice. 
and nobody has access to eating animals at this point, so it wasn't like they're eating animals. So he surprisingly shed blood. The only other blood that had been shed prior to this seems to be when God killed the animal to make the animal skins. Uh, Abel's sacrifice is accepted, not Cain. His countenance falls. He's pissed off. The blood rushes from his face back. The same way when you blush, and you could say Adam and Eve, in a certain sense, blush, the blood rushes from inside to the outside. So there's oscillation between inside and outside, whether you're going pale and being angry or blushing and feeling shame. Well, the, the question we probably should ask is why was Abel's sacrifice accepted and Cain's was not? Well, I think it harkens back to the same thing in terms of why was the covering of vegetation inadequate and the covering of the animal skins was adequate. And this is, the, the, this is uh, because this is why I can justify, I think, the issue is murder, because Cain was an actual murderer of his own brother. Abel murdered an animal instead of his brother. So what's it better, to kill an animal or kill your brother? It's better to kill an animal and not kill your brother. But the real problem is not whether you kill your brother or an animal. The problem is that you want to murder. And, and so this seems to be the problem of the heart. The heart, the hidden thing inside of you, wants to murder the otherness of other bodies or take them into your body. Now, what do you do when you want bodies to come together to form a body politic, given the fact that you're a murderer? Well, that's the problem of Cain. Cain is the founder of the first city in the Bible. Ironically, this man who knows that he's going to be a fugitive and a wanderer upon the earth because he's murdered his brother, and anyone who sees him will slay him. God puts the mark on his forehead and says, not so. Anyone who slays Cain, vengeance will be taken upon him sevenfold. So what allow, and now, so he goes away and he founds the first city in the Bible. So what seems to be the implication of this? The implication is the biblical teaching on politics from the get-go seems to be politics is composed of people that are on the outside, get along with one another, are law-abiding, and seem to share a body politic. But what's going on on the inside? They're all canes. They're all murderers. And they're fugitive and wanderers. They're solitaries. They cannot live with one another. And yet here they are living with one another after Cain founds that city. What allows them to live with one another? It's the threat of violence. The threat of vengeance allows them to live with one another. Now they can pretend to get along, and they can pretend that they are a body politic, but they are in fact are not a body politic and they do not share, but they can think they share, they have the illusion they share, they have the appearances of sharing, and that's better than killing one another. So this again goes back to why did God accept Abel's sacrifice? It's better to threaten violence or to kill an animal or to fear vengeance than to do what you really want to do. Because if you do what you really want to do, every, everybody's at war with everybody else. What Hobbes runs with in his limited way with the idea of a war of all against all. And that does not lead to a city, but if you pretend that you're not at war with one another, you can pretend to have a city, and that's better than nothing. Okay, now that I think is, so to speak, the theological problem of unshareable, unshareable bodies expressed in this narrative form. But I think it converges with the philosophical claim that, uh, that uh, the same problem exists, and there's a gap between inner and outer, and this is most obviously Made, the arguments made uh, by Plato's image of Gyges' ring. Um, hopefully you've heard of this, but uh, Gyges, this character, puts on a ring that makes him invisible, just like uh, Bilbo and Frodo and Lord of the Rings, which is derived from this. What does this make you do? It reveals what you want to do. The fact that you put on the ring and you become invisible in terms of your surface shows what you invisibly want to do. And then, but then you're concerned about being seen because you know if people saw what you want to do, they would kill you, take vengeance. You wouldn't be able to live with anybody. They would then murder you if you did what you want. So the ring, the power of the ring is to put it on and off, to appear and to disappear, to go from the outside to back to your heart. And the Gyges ring reveals your heart. It reveals what you secretly, truly want to do, but it also reveals your fear of doing that. And your fear keeps you, because you don't have a ring, from doing that. And so it allows you to live with one another. Well, Plato extends this in various writings and summarizes this passion that the ring reveals is that we all have an irrational love of our own. We only love things if we own them. And what you own above all else is your body, seemingly. Uh, so you don't love things that are not your own. And so it, only if you can bring somebody in and make it your own, that's the image of eating something, taking it into you, uh, then you can love it, but you won't love it if it's not your own. <laughs> And this is why, in Plato's argument, everybody's in a cave, because they're in a cave because they're deluded about this fact. They only love their own. 
well, how, why is the cave kind of an image of a city as well as our ignorance and our believing in illusions? Because what, what Plato, I think, is also teaching is, uh, and he's carrying on kind of implicit argument, Greek tragedy, that politics is the need for a body politic, but just like the, the Cain argument or narrative argument about the nature of politics, people really can't come together because they do love their own. So how can they come together in a uh, political union? They create a body politic. How do you make it a body? Well, you think it's, oh, you all come together and share things. No, what you share is you all share that murderous hostility to what is not your own, and you make it outside. You turn everybody else outside the pol political union into your enemy, and then you can feel like your friends. You can feel like you share. You can feel like this is our own body because we hate those that are outside of it. And then you have the illusion of shareable ownership, but it's an illusion because it's founded upon your hostility towards enemies outside. Outside, you could say this is tied in with groupthink as well. This is the power of groupthink. It's the power of the body politic. It's why in Greek tragedy, if you've ever read the Humanities, uh, finally you reconcile the Furies with the Olympian gods. How do you make it possible? Athena announces, let us hate with singleness of heart. Well, what do you hate with singleness of heart in Athens? You hate anything that's not Athens. As long as you can hate with singleness of heart, you become single, you become unified, you become a shareable body. Uh, well, and so this is, uh, and, and so to, to make a further extension of this, what makes that possible? In one sense, you think your friendship makes it possible. No, your friendship doesn't unify you. It's your enemies that make you friends. So your friendship is the illusion. Your enemies is the true fact. How do you see this? It's implicit in Oedipus, it comes out in Plato in various ways, but it also becomes a key element in religious sacrifice. If you can kill a scapegoat, you make one person within your community that enemy, you murder somebody outside, you put them outside the gates of that city, that is the one you hate, and now you can love each other. So you focalize that murder and you murder one victim, that murder of the victim reveals your desire to murder, but now you have the illusion you get along and you're not murderers. So you, you create the very thing that Cain created, but Cain created this with, through God's mark. The, so to speak, pagan way of doing this is the continual sacrifice every year to keep the thing going, to keep the illusion up, to allow you to deal with your murderous desires and yet still have a shareable political body because you need to literally to survive. Well, so this is why I think the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful of all things. What can you do about it? Keep deluding yourself. Uh, organizing your violence in different ways. Well, I think that is why the gospel is good news. The good news uh, of the gospel is that you can have a shareable body. You can truly share bodies, and you don't need enemies, the illusion. You don't need the, the, the appearance of unity in order to share a body. And uh, what makes this, uh, 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 well, to, to let me back up a bit, because this is quite a claim that, that, that if we're all murderers in our heart, what will it take to get rid of that? Well, it's going to take a miracle. The miracle is Christ being murdered on the cross, his blood being shed. Okay, now, why is murder what's going on here? Why, is it, why does it have to be bloody? Because you, you look in the Gospel of Mark, the minute Christ breathes his last, suddenly the scene switches over to the, temp, the curtain in the temple, and it's torn in two from top to bottom. Well, why the curtain in the temple? I think that curtain harkens back to the veils that Adam and Eve used to cover their nakedness. Because whether, whether you go with this veil and you kind of keep it up through various typological things, Noah's Ark, Ark of the Covenant, uh, the holies of holies in the temple, all these things finally lead to that moment when Jesus' body is its own temple. When his body dies, his body is literally murdered. That veil, that need, that protecting veil of God's mercy that allows us to live with our murderous hearts is torn in two and we can truly live without a veil. Because the, that, the reason God demanded that you veil yourself with blood and that Abel's uh, sacrifice was accepted is because finally only that moment of Christ's bloodshed are we going to get rid of that veil, the thing that separates bodies from one another. And so that's the moment it's overcome, this need to veil ourselves, to lie about our murderous hearts, because now we in fact can share our bodies through Christ becoming part of him as the victim, the scapegoat crucified outside the walls of the city, Jerusalem being the a continuation of Cain City by crucifying Christ, uh, he now notifies exactly what's going on. He takes the veil away. You see exactly the nature of the lie. You see what your heart is. Your hidden heart is now manifest. You cannot live with one another. 
But you can if he comes back from the dead. Now you see the whole world, not from we the friends and our enemies out there. You have to see the whole world from the status of what, who we've made an enemy and looking at us, we're not really friends. So if you look at the world from the standpoint of this enemy, he can transform us into friends and we can truly have shareable bodies. And uh, in addition, uh, the other aspect of share, shareable body obviously is communion. This is my body broken for you. This is my blood. So the body and the blood, the communion, is literally where we partake of this unity, this shareable body. And it has to be a body, and it's a body that's murdered, because that's the heart of the problem. Uh, well, one, one last thing. I just wasn't sure whether to add this, but it's kind of a, something that I, I take up in the latter part of my book. I think this is so central to our political understanding, self-understanding, yet so much of the heart of our, our, uh, our deceit all times. It's particularly apparent in modern philosophy. It's the temptation, essentially, of what I'd call the left. Politically, the left. This is an argument for the right. But the left, the left it has its eye on this ball. It knows it's a problem. It's trying to overcome the unshareable body, unshareable things, unshareable goods. How can you make it so you share in equality, share in dignity, all these things? It's trying to do this, but it's trying to do this without Christ. It's trying to accomplish the goals of Christianity, but through strictly political means. So can it do it without this violence? That, I argue in various ways, it cannot do. The violence is still there. So if you want to create a shareable body, whether it be through communism, equality of freedom, uh, freedom uh, Rousseau's general will, various m modes of doing this, and they're all partake of a common root, going back to Rousseau's uh, social contract. Uh, the violence is still there, but it tends to be violence you turn towards yourself. If everybody equally, so to speak, punishes themselves, or as Nietzsche says, introverted violence, then you can solve it because you turn one part of you into the scapegoat and one part of you becomes the body politic and shareable. And so it's, it's kind of a certain form of uh, internal cruelty, as Nietzsche says. That's the way to do it without Christ, but the violence doesn't go away. And so that's just the modern form of creating a body politic based on a lie. And it's still alive today in left-wing politics that wants Christian goals but without the need of doing it through the resurrected body of Christ. Uh, so that's just kind of a quick... Uh, rundown of the themes that come out in my book and the fundamental question of why are we desperately wicked because we can't share bodies but the good news is that we can but we have to be murdered with that victim uh, because we've got to put to death that heart that's desperately wicked and then our hearts can come back from the dead and we can have what Deuteronomy calls a crucified I mean a circumcised heart why a circumcised heart What's it go back to? Those privates of Adam and Eve. Why do they have to shed blood at the level of the privates? To remind you what you privately are thinking and that you think only privately. But you can actually truly become public and charitable by circumcising your heart rather than the external uh, appearances. So thank you for letting me go through that.